back when I was in seminary, the Barna Research Group conducted a, a survey to compare the lives of self-described born-again Christians with the rest of the general public. The study looked at uh, 20 different lifestyle elements, things like engaging in gossip, lying, or sex outside of marriage, uh, seeking payback against someone who hurt them, while also investigating people's relationship with the poor. David Kinneman, the director of the study, summarized the results like this. The lifestyles and relationships of born-again believers are not much different than others. Seeing some of these things might be why one of the major uh, modern criticisms of American Christianity is that people might uh, feel they can pray a prayer, get some spiritual fire insurance, maybe even engage in some spiritual activities, but then live lives that, that bear no sign of, of love for their neighbor or repentance. And at the same time, many who see such things can then find it easy to conclude that God must not really care about how his people live. I mean, if he did, it's argued, then he would do something about it. So maybe God doesn't care. Maybe God's just not there. And so their posture towards the things of God takes a cynical turn. And it would not surprise me if that's what happened to the husband of a woman named Susan. Author and journalist Philip Yancey once wrote about a conversation with a friend of his, Susan. One day she told Yancey that her husband did not measure up, and she was actively looking to find other men to meet her needs for intimacy. At the same conversation, Susan, a professing Christian, also mentioned that she rose early each day to, quote, spend an hour with the Father. Seeing a disconnect that the woman apparently did not see, Yancey asked her, in your meetings with the Father, do any moral issues come up that might influence this pending decision about leaving your husband? Susan bristled. That sounds like the response of a white Anglo-Saxon male. The Father and I are into relationship, not morality. Relationship means being wholly supportive and standing alongside me, not judging. Well, Susan could be said to eagerly engage regularly in a form of personal worship. An entire hour each day, she said, her relationship with God wasn't the kind that spilled over into other relationships, or as she would describe it, morality. And yet if the father that Susan speaks about were invited into that conversation, what would he have to say about how, what he's looking for in our relationships with him and with other people? Well, we find an answer in the book of, of Malachi, in chapter 2, beginning in verse 10. In your pew Bibles, it starts on page 1,489. This is the word of God through his prophet. Have we not all one Father? Did not one God create us? Why do we profane the covenant of our fathers by breaking faith with one another? Judah has broken faith. A detestable thing has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. Judah has desecrated the sanctuary the Lord loves by marrying the daughter of a foreign god. As for the man who does this, whoever he may be, may the Lord cut him off from the tents of Jacob, even though he brings offerings to the Lord Almighty. Another thing you do, you flood the Lord's altar with tears. You weep and wail because he no longer pays attention to your offerings or accepts them with pleasure from your hands. You ask, why? It is because the Lord is acting as a witness between you and the wife of your youth, because you have broken faith with her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. Has not the Lord made them one in flesh and spirit? They are his. And why one? Because he was seeking godly offspring. So guard yourself in your spirit and do not break faith with the wife of your youth. I hate divorce, says the Lord God of Israel, and I hate a man's covering himself with violence as well as with his garment says the Lord Almighty. So guard yourself in your spirit and do not break faith. You have wearied the Lord with your words. How have we wearied him, you ask? By saying, all who do evil are good in the eyes of the Lord, and he is pleased with them. Or where is the God of justice? See, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me, then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? 
For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit and refine and pur- as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness. And the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord as in the days gone by, as in former years. So I will come near to you for judgment. I will be quick to testify against sorcerers, adulterers, and perjurers, against those who defraud laborers of their wages, who oppress the widows and the fatherless, and deprive aliens of justice. But do not fear me, says the Lord Almighty. So what do we see in here? We see a God who cares about our relationships, how we treat people. For those of you joining us maybe for the first time today, in this new year we've been talking about spiritual renewal as we've been looking at the book of the Old Testament prophet Malachi. And while spiritual renewal begins uh, with our relationship with God, as we talked about last week, by nature it spills over into our relationships with other people. And there's no relationship closer than marriage. And yet in Malachi's day, there's no relationship that God's people were failing at more than at marriage. This, uh, this fall, when it was a lot warmer, um, I got to officiate the wedding for my brother-in-law. And there, with, with friends and family who had gathered as witnesses, we heard him and his now wife make promises to each other, including a promise to be faithful to one another as long as they both shall live, to stick together, not just in the good and easy times, but, but in the hard times too. And not just declaring this before the people who had gathered, but before God himself as a witness. And not just signing a human contract, uh, uh, but making a covenant, a sacred promise before God, declaring that the two of them would become one. Because that's the nature of marriage, just as it was in the days of Malachi. You see, for them, marriage was not only a covenant that that they entered into with each other, with God as a witness, but one that they carried out in line with the covenant that God had made through through Moses with Israel. You see, those marriage vows that they took were in response to the law of Moses, committing themselves to relate to their spouse the way that God had already called them to. And that's why Malachi asks in verse 10, why do we profane the covenant of our fathers, the ones that they first heard this covenant through Moses, by breaking faith with one another. Malachi uses that that same word translated breaking faith or or being unfaithful five times in the span of of seven verses. You see, what they were failing at was God's call to be faithful. At first glance, uh, those verses may seem to be addressing two different issues or two different groups of people. In verse 11, God's talking about people, uh, his people, Judah, quote, marrying the daughter of a foreign god. In other words, uh, Jewish men were marrying women who worshipped pagan gods and engaged in the same idolatry that that God had gotten out of his people uh, through their 70 years in exile, reminding them of that. And in verses that follow, he talks about how they're breaking faith with the wife of their youth, reminding them in, in verse 14 of that marriage covenant they made and making it explicit in verse 16 that the way that they're breaking it is through divorcing them. And yet, as a number of biblical scholars have pointed out, while it's possible that this could be talking about two different groups of people, the two are not mutually exclusive. You see, given the the custom of arranged marriages back then and how early those things would take place, hence the phrase, the wife of your youth, you'd be hard-pressed to find a large group of never-married people in that era, which means that There were adult Jewish men seeking to marry pagan women when they were already married to somebody else. As multiple biblical scholars have asserted, men were callously divorcing their wife of their covenant, their faithful wives, in order to marry younger pagan women, engaging in what it's often called aversion divorce. Divorce because of loss of affection. Divorce because you just don't like them anymore or because you would rather be married to somebody else, something that ancient marriage records reveal wasn't just practiced by men, but but by women as well. As Gordon Hugenberger notes, 
Although divorce, because of loss of affection, was recognized under Old Testament civic law, it is nowhere morally approved. Unlike divorce based on a spouse's uh, sexual infidelity, unlike desertion, uh, which uh, many have noted can take the form of a person leaving themselves or a person forcing the other to leave by making it impossible for them to stay, often because of, of abuse. In contrast to these biblical grounds for divorce, the kind of divorce that Malachi is talking about violates God's covenant. And not just their covenant with each other, not just their covenant with, with God, but violates the nature of marriage that the two would become one. As Old Testament scholar Jack Collins notes, the ones left behind are, like, are likely the ones in verse 13 who, quote, flood the Lord's altar with tears. But as Hugenberger notes, this kind of divorce doesn't just hurt those left behind. It doesn't just break the marriage covenant. It also defiles a person's character. That's what verse 16 is getting at. All the scholars that I've, I've read about this uh, describe this and, and the verse right before it as some of the hardest verses in the Old Testament to translate. The older translations uh, treat hate as something that God is doing here. God hates divorce. He, he hates a man covering himself with violence. And yet others see the divorcing husband as the one who hates, the one who does not love his wife. And, and that's what God is commenting on. And that helps us better understand what God is trying to actually say here. As the ESV translates it, for the one who, who does not love his wife but divorces her covers his garment with violence, or as some scholars have rendered this last word, crime. The Old Testament scholar Douglas Stewart puts it, aversion divorce is here called metaphorically uh, covering one's clothes with crime. It's, it's like you're saying you've got blood on your hands. You've got crime on your clothes. And so Malachi pleads with them, saying, do not break faith. Do not be unfaithful. Because as verse 13 shows, their unfaithfulness in this way is already affecting them. You see, God is saying, it's not just that you're divorcing the spouse that you made a covenant with. The one that I was a witness to, you've already adopted the pagan practices of the one that you divorced them for. You see, the, religion of, the religions of Israel's neighbors uh, thought that a god was someone that could be manipulated by certain kinds of shows of emotion that we see in verse 13, the, the weeping and, and the wailing that's described. And so when the Israelites noticed that their god was, was not paying attention to their offerings, they responded the way that pagan worshipers would, would have responded. You see, in, in those religions, it didn't matter how you were living, only that you were doing your religious duty. Human relationships didn't matter. Personal morality, irrelevant. And Malachi seemed to be addressing a people who didn't even think that God's unresponsiveness might be because of unrepentant sin. And yet what we find in God's word is that spousal infidelity is inseparably linked to spiritual well-being. See, in, in 1 Peter 3, 7, we read that a marriage must be in good repair or else the husband's or else a couple's prayers will be hindered, saying, Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect so that nothing will hinder your prayers. In a similar way, in Matthew 5, we read this, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift why we can't say that we're right in our relationship with God when we're not right in our relationship with others. You see, to be faithful to God and his covenant has implications for all of our relationships. Now, we might recognize what those implications are when it comes to a spouse whom we know we owe love to, but we might not have considered what it is that we owe others, what it means to be faithful to them. And yet our passage begins with Malachi asking rhetorically, did not one God create us? As a way of pointing back to where we're told that every person that we meet is created in the image of God. And as a result, a spouse isn't the only person to whom we actually owe love. You see, Malachi's theology of marriage and what we owe others are both rooted in creation. 
You see, even before Jesus spoke the words that you heard already in our scripture reading, Jewish teachers knew that the second greatest command after the call to love God was Leviticus 19, verse 18. Love your neighbor, love your near one as yourself. A command that has application from the most intimate relationships to our business associates, from those that we know that we owe love to to those that we're more likely to ignore. Just as God acts as a witness against the marriage partner gone astray, we see that same language in chapter 3, in verse 5. God says, I will be a swift witness, or as our translation puts it, I will be quick to testify against sorcerers, adulterers, and perjurers, against those who defraud laborers of their wages, who oppress the widows and the fatherless and deprive aliens of justice. But do not fear me, says the Lord Almighty. You see, just as God is a witness to marriage vows, knowing what we owe to a spouse, he is also the one who created us all, and thus a witness against those who don't treat others the way the second greatest commandment says they deserve to be treated. And while all equally bear the image of God, the reality is some of us are just more likely to not be treated that way. That's why we see in the latter half of verse 5, that's what it's talking about, talking about how we treat widows, fatherless, and the aliens in our, in our midst. As a Stuart notes, Malachi preaches against the social injustice of his day, including abuse of the poor and the dependent. And many of God's people since have done the same. During the civil rights movement of the 50s and the 60s, many pastors spoke against the social injustices present in our own country and confronted the indifference found amongst many white churchgoers challenging people to consider what they owe their African-American neighbors who were created by the same God, challenging those who claim to worship the same God but failed to love their neighbors in time of need. You see, God cares about how we treat others. His mentions in the same verse of perjurers tells us he cares about how we use our words and how those affect other people. His mention of adulterers tells us he cares about how we steward our sexuality and that what goes on in the bedroom is about more than just those two people. His mention of, of those who defraud laborers tells us he cares about our business dealings with others and that our relationship with God should impact those types of relationships as well. We see in this passage that faithfulness to God always plays out in faithfulness to others. God cares about how we treat each other. So maybe at this point you're thinking, yeah, Keith, we get this. Uh, why do we need to be reminded of something as basic as love your neighbor as yourself? Well, let me tell you a story. In a few weeks, our country, without knowing it, by the way, our country will observe the birthday of our oldest daughter, who loves watching football, with a big football game, the Super Bowl. Birthday Super Bowl. And at the end of the game, the winner will hoist a trophy, the Vince Lombardi Trophy, named after the Green Bay Packers coach, the, the legendary coach um, who led his team to victory in the first two Super Bowls as part of a stretch where he won five championships in seven years. So you can imagine what it might be like to sit, or sit under the instruction of such a revered a championship coach with, with everything that he knows about the game about working as a team, about perseverance, about developing young people. What kind of advice, what kind of advanced lessons would he have for a team full of literally professional ball players? Well, as someone actually from the, the business world, Mike Crandall writes, when the players came in to start training camp, they expected to immediately begin where they left off and work on ways to advance their game and learn fancy new ways to win the championship in the new season. But when they sat down and began, much to their surprise, Vince Lombardi held up an object in front of them, a round, oblong ball with laces. And he said to them, gentlemen, this is a football. And then he told them to turn their playbooks to page one. And he began talking to them about the fundamentals, blocking, tackling, throwing, catching. These are professional athletes we're talking about. 
You see, with a group of professional athletes who'd already been to the verge of the mountaintop, he took them back to the basics. That's how the stretch of championships began. And if you've ever listened to an interview with a coach whose team just lost, you know why guys like Vince Lombardi had to do that with their players. You see, they probably just witnessed a player demonstrating tremendous natural speed, looking fabulous as they ran towards a person with a ball, and then when they catch them, they temporarily forget to tackle the way they were trained, and the ball carrier keeps on going. Or they just witnessed somebody paid to run and catch the ball and see the ball thrown their way, getting excited about where they're going to go after they catch the ball, turn their eyes that way while the ball is still here, before the ball gets there, and then feel the ball bounce off their fingers to the ground as all the fans of the team groan. You see, the coach who observed it all will almost always say the same thing at the press conference after the game. We need to get back to the basics. We, we forgot the fundamentals. You see, the problem that, that we face, whether we're talking about a, a game or we're talking about the life of faith, is, is the same thing. We can get so focused on, on other things, good things even, that we end up forgetting about the basics. Because if we fail at them, those other really good things that we can get excited about along the way won't amount to much. And we too can drop the ball. You see, in the middle of talking about spiritual things, something that the church in Corinth was, was really excited about, the Apostle Paul writes to them this, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, one of the gifts that they were really excited about, but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I, have, if I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing. You see, the math of God's kingdom is this. Anything minus love equals nothing, which is why we never get past the basics. We never get past the call for love. And yet you may have noticed that the first thing that God stands against as a witness to, or a witness against in verse 5, was sorcery. As Stuart explains, sorcery was a pagan practice that counterfeited true prophecy and thus led people who followed it into destruction rather than salvation, all the while thinking they were following God, maybe as a result, waging a war that God never told them to wage, leading to things like untold deaths and, and suffering amongst the people, all because someone declared, God said, when God said no such thing. How many people, even today, maybe even in this room, are still nursing wounds from being part of a movement where someone claimed to be speaking a new word from the Lord, someone that they followed to their own harm because they wanted to get beyond the basics. And yet the people who led them there, who led them to their harm, are the first people that God testifies against. You see, in this passage, we not only see a God that cares about our relationship, we see a God who cares about us, cares about how these actions affect us. It's something that I... Uh, uh, discovered since becoming a, a father, much to my surprise, was how quickly my emotions spike when I see one of my children mistreating the other. My response isn't simply because I want my children to behave a certain way, but because I want my children to be treated a certain way. It just so happens that I have the same relationship with both the one who sinned and the one they sinned against. I'm, I'm their father. And in light of that, did you notice how verse 10 begins? Have we not all one Father? In other words, before considering what our relationships with others look like, we need to start with what our relationship with God looks like, like a father to their children. You see, faithfulness starts with seeing God as your Father. As the Old Testament scholar C. Hassel Bullock put it, all of the relationships and the regulations of them can be traced back to the fatherhood of God. And we won't find ourselves drawn to faithful living in our relationships with each other until we see how God the Father is first faithful to us, faithful to stand 
by the one whose spouse was unfaithful, acting as a witness against the one who felt abandoned. Because he cares about the destruction and the pain that those things leave behind, he sees those tears. As we see at the end of our passage, God is faithful to stand by the victims of other sin as a witness and even judge the evil that hurts his image bearers. And yet, God is also faithful to purify his people. While some may echo the people in verse 17 who see evil and say, all who do evil are good in the eyes of God, or where is the God of justice? God reveals his response in the verses that follow. If you look at chapter 3, beginning in verse 2, he speaks of a time when the Lord will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap, when he will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. And then making it clear that, that what he will cleanse are, are not precious metals or, or clothes, but people. His people. The image of the refiner's fire and the launderer's soap speak to not only the thoroughness, but also the severity of the cleansing. The people of, of this time, they would have been very familiar uh, with the use of fire to purify metals. Basically, you apply heat until the precious metal begins to melt which caused the impurities to float to the top, which are then skimmed off, separated from the rest of it. As for the laundry, well, back then they didn't have actual soap like we think of it today. It was more like lye, and it burned. It was dissolved in water, when then clothes were beaten and scrubbed and, and rinsed in order to remove the dirt and the grime and the filth in it. Just like the fire for metals, it was a separation process as Stuart put it, God will separate what, does, what deserves to remain from what is not worthy of keeping. But it's not necessarily a pleasant experience. Maybe if it helps, uh, consider something maybe more modern that you're maybe more used to. If, if you've ever had a wound where there's a concern for infection, maybe something getting in it that you don't want it, um, you've probably felt the burn from having rubbing alcohol or hydrogen peroxide or, or even just soapy water on that open wound, something that tends to sting while killing the things that don't belong in you. And yet in a similar way, God's means of cleansing us and our relationships, getting rid of the things that don't belong among his people, often come through very uncomfortable means. You see, asking somebody how you have sinned against them is unpleasant. That takes humility. Giving that answer can bring back painful memories. And hearing that answer can sting. Feeling the conviction of sin and confessing it to another, asking for forgiveness is unpleasant. It hurts our pride. Offering forgiveness is unpleasant. It means forgoing the desire to see them pay for what they did and paying down that debt yourself. Repenting, uh, turning away from our sin patterns, the things that we previously turned to to handle life's problems, uh, can leave us feeling anxious, not only about how we'll manage without that thing we've come to depend on, but anxious about what a new way of living will actually look and feel like. And yet, these are the things that God calls his people to, to be faithful to him and to those made in his image, both for our good and for the other person's good. And yet the power to live faithfully in all of our relationships comes from the faithfulness of another. You see, the one that Malachi speaks of in, in verse 1, when he speaks of the day when suddenly the Lord that you are seeking will come. You see, when Jesus Christ came to this earth, he came as one who was under God's law, bound to live by it in faithfulness to the Father, and in doing so showed how the Father is actually faithful to us, not only teaching God's law in all of its fullness, but fulfilling it in his perfect, sinless life, and then offering his perfectly faithful record to any who would trust, not in their own faithfulness to God, but in his faithfulness in their place. Even though Jesus knew how often we would fail him, how often we would be unfaithful to him, even though he knew what being faithful to the Father and his will would ultimately cost. You see, the law declared that the penalty for sin is death. And when Jesus went to the cross for us as the faithful one taking the place of the unfaithful, taking the place of sinners, he had to face one final choice. 
in Matthew 27, those challenging Jesus' relationship with the Father said this, if you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Save yourself. You see in the pain, in the agony, the anguish, the shame that Jesus was experiencing on that cross, and knowing what would be coming next as he hung on a Roman instrument of death, if there was any time that Jesus would have walked away from us because that relationship was too hard, too painful, just not worth it anymore, that would have been the time. And yet he stayed. And he did it so that you could be assured that he will never leave you or forsake you, that he would remain faithful to the end, even as God calls his people to be faithful. You see, as unpleasant as confrontation is, as painful as, as confession can be, as, as hard as repentance can feel, as much as forgiveness costs, what Jesus did on the cross was far more unpleasant, far more painful, far harder, and far more costly, and he did it for you. He stayed so that when confronted with your own sin, you don't have to wilt, so that you can be free to confess your own sins, knowing the one who bore them on the cross already, so that you can turn away from one thing in repentance, knowing the love of the one that you are turning to and what he did so that you can be forgiven. You see, God is faithful to his people so that we can learn to live the same way with each other. As Lewis Smedes writes, I want to say that if you have a ship that you will not desert, if you have people that you will not forsake, if you have causes you will not abandon, then you are like God the one who keeps his promise to us. In uh, 2019, a series of articles ran in the uh, New York Magazine. One by author Heber Heather Heberleski was titled, Is Marriage Obsolete? After listing a number of reasons people would find it so, she asks this, So why do I love this torturous state of affairs so much? After listing a, a number of things that her readers might be thinking, she says that it's actually because of something else, the promise. The promise that through sickness or poverty or worse, someone will stay by her side to the end because, she writes, there is nothing more divine than being able to say, today I am really truly at my worst, knowing that it won't make the other run for the hills. My husband has seen my worst before. We both know that our worst is likely to get worse from here. Somehow, knowing that they'll stay, somehow, she says, that feels like grace. And that's the kind of relationship God invites us into through Jesus Christ, showing us the grace that stays, the grace that transforms, the grace that teaches us to love others the way that God in Christ has loved us, the grace of the one who is faithful. Let me pray for us.